Hello there, it's um, May 26, 2020. I'm Joe Weston, and here we are for our weekly online global community for lasting peace. I'm gonna ask you all if you wouldn't mind to mute your mute for now. We'll have time afterwards to speak. Uh, but it's great to see you all. It's nice to see familiar faces, and it's great to see new faces. And as you know, we gather every week on Tuesdays as a community to practice together, to, to hold space with each other, to uh, care for one another, <clears throat> and on some level to hold space <clears throat> for what's unfolding on this planet. And I remember two years ago, it was probably about two years ago that we started this. It's great. And then just looking at the pictures of those of you who were there at the very start of this, woohoo, <laughs> we're still here. <laughs> and. Um, and one of the images I gave is like, if you think of a tree, the tree, the beauty of a tree, the patience of a tree, and the, the power and the groundedness of a tree and the generosity of a tree, the beauty of a tree, just hangs out for a really, really, really long time. And, uh, and the idea of who on the planet, who, which human beings on the planet are holding that kind of space for what's unfolding makes me think of the, um, during the Occupy movement in Oakland, uh, when I was living in, uh, in, in, the, in the East Bay, that I would go with a group of people every day for an hour and sit in silent meditation at the camps where, where, where people were, were sitting. And part of that for me was who's holding the center in a sense, who's holding that stillness, who's holding that hope for, for a, a peace and reconciliation. And that while the chaos was happening around us, that we always knew that there was some um, stillness. And in a sense, we as the trees for our people, for, for all human beings, you could say that we're holding that space, just like a midwife would, that uh, as we I use that image of life, that image a lot of midwives for the dying and midwives for what's emerging. That here we are in a time where uh, we, can, we can say, that uh, we're holding a certain level of resilience, we're holding a certain level of fierce compassion and trying to stay focused on this idea of what is unfolding, that we can be still in that, see what the vision is and be support in that, in that process. And that, I know it's a big task and I'm not saying we're the only ones, but it's great to see what we're weaving around the planet with people from various parts of the planet Coming, what I say is weaving a golden thread of lasting peace throughout the world and particularly at this time. I want to talk, so what we'll do is I'll give a little talk just to set the intention for our practice, then I'll lead you in our practice, then we'll have time to reflect and then we'll close with a dedication as we always do. And this week I'd like to weave a couple of discussions that I said last week, um, a lot of you were saying some of the things I was saying was kind of provocative or just to have you thinking about if we're talking about lasting peace, I think we have to really, for ourselves, clarify what is lasting peace and how is that different from peace? And I've talked a lot about this, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on that. But on one level, talking with people around the world at conferences and who I engage with, with, with various work that I'm doing with people who their, their job is conflict resolution and peace negotiation, that oftentimes what I'll hear is peace is the first step to actually negotiate peace, to get people to put down their arms is one step, but then the work begins, because then you still haven't resolved the conflicts, you still haven't resolved the challenges. You're still dealing with people who hate each other, perhaps, or, or want to oppress another, one another. And how do you then start creating a culture where they can actually start or overcome those issues, come to some reconciliation, find some healing, open to the possibility of building trust and safety so that uh, that leads to that's the foundation for cultural transformation and a thriving culture so if you think about that 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 takes a lot of work and part of what this work is is helping us create the foundation to be able to hold that kind of space enough nervous system regulation and resilience and enough capacity to keep our hearts open in a way where we don't get harmed and we don't harm others to step into what's unknown and to find alliances in the most surprising places. That to me is the foundation of what um, is going to bring about lasting peace on this planet. Last time I talked about why don't we have it? 
And I think it's because of a lot of false assumptions we have or unexamined assumptions. Speak for myself, uh, speak for others I speak with, and this might also resonate with you. And one of them is that this idea that we really know what peace is and that we have this idea of saying, oh, we've just got to get back to peace. Oh, those days when there were peace. And if you really do examination and you look through history, you're going to see that that really is a fallacy. There has not been a lot of peace on the planet, that, the, that peace is the anomaly. And I'm not saying that it's good or bad. I'm simply saying that we just have to recognize that I believe that our true nature is for peace, is for connection, is for mutual empowerment. However, our history shows us that what way what our habituation has led us to more war than to peace. So that's one thing to consider and also to consider what polarity is. And as you know, I'm doing a lot of work on this with the fierce civility work I'm doing is that, that we have to break through our polarities. It's the polarities that's keeping us locked in these patterns that we're in. And the image that I use is like a polarity. You think it's pulling you apart. It is in a sense, it's creating chasms between people and thinking that there's no way to bridge that. However, when you think of it, a polarity is two forces that are pushing, pushing against each other. It's, it, this is my viewpoint, this is my viewpoint. And then the pushing, like two rams pushing against each other. First of all, you get a very myopic view. You're not seeing the broader picture. You're putting a lot of energy into keeping that polarity going when that energy can be used for other things. And so the idea is how do you shift that and break that? The first thing to consider is that maybe is to examine what your beliefs are about polarities and that we make false assumptions that of what we think is the polarity of something. And the example I use is that we think that the polarity of war is peace. You can think that. I'm just asking you to consider that the polarity, the polarity is simply the negative of something. So that the polarity of war is not war, not peace. Peace comes close but that the reason why we're not getting peace is because we think that by, by looking at that, that when we eliminate war, we'll have peace. No, when we eliminate war, we'll have no war. When we have no more war, we can open up to the idea of peace. Let peace be on its own <laughs> because the polarity of peace is not peace. And you can say that as a personal inner experience uh, when you, for yourself as an internal process, when you know what inner peace is, the polarity of your inner peace is not an inner peace. And that's, and that's the game you can play there. So that's what we talked about last time. And I want to weave it back to a few times when I said the, another reason why we are getting stuck in these patterns and why we can't break through is because of our habituation to how we've learned history and how we have learned, um, for instance, you can go as far back as, as I said, um, the Judeo-Christian Muslim Bible, where there's a good and evil, there's a patriarchal system of, of man, woman, and, um, and, and that in our whole mythology, going back to the Greeks and before that, there's always a good guy and a bad guy, a protagonist and an antagonist. And that, again, if we're locked into that, then it's almost impossible for us to move into our current age and engage people that agitate us without instantly locking ourselves into the role of good guy and locking the other into the role of bad guy. Now, I wanted to say I'm using good guy and bad guy. I'm using those terms specifically because they're terms that in America we use. It's gender specific in the sense of guy, but this is for all people. I just want to clarify that. So, so what we have to do as well is to recognize where are you on a very unconscious level, even though you think you're progressive and you're, and you're inclusive and all of that, in your deep DNA even, in your history, in your nervous system wiring, and it may not be in your actions, it may not even be in your words, but perhaps in your thoughts, where are you still holding on to needing to, to, to classify things as I'm good, you're bad. I'm the victim, you're the perpetrator. And, and how that all plays out. And that again, the, the polarity of good guy is not necessarily bad guy. The polarity of good guy is not good guy. Because that opens it up and gives you a chance to examine, well, what is bad guy? 
and the polarity of bad guy is, is not bad guy. The reason why I bring that up is because it'll bring us back into movement. When we're stuck in good guy and bad guy, I'm gonna give you, I have visual images for you today, visual aids for you today. When we get locked in polarity, we get locked in this, right? There's like, there's no movement. It's just this one thing coming from one side, one thing coming from the other side. They're pushing against each other. It's static, it doesn't move. And this is what happens when we're stuck in good guy, bad guy. But the practice, on a moment to moment to basis is to just say to yourself, in every good guy, there has to be a little bit of bad. And in every bad guy, there has to be a little bit of good. And, that, and we can play that out in many ways. And then when you do that, when you can put a little bit of one side of the polarity into back into where it is, so from, from let's say good and bad, if you can put a little bit of bad and good using really extreme terms and a little bit of good and bad, Guess what you get? You get this. That's what this symbol on one level means, the yin yang symbol. And if you see, it's the same thing as this, but this one has motion. You can see the purpose of this is there's motion. There's a flow beginning to happen. And the flow only happens because if you take this and put a little bit of a white dot in the black and a little bit of black dot in the white, you'll see that it just automatically shifts and gets you into motion. And it's in this dynamic where new solutions can emerge. And this is what I would say is, what that is, is um, getting you into a state of presence, awareness, balance, and flow, which we've been practicing for quite a while now. So I wanna just offer that as a way of weaving a few of our stories together and, um, and appreciating all your, all your feedback on that. And let's keep talking about that. Let's keep um, that discussion going. And the idea is, if you really choose, if you really believe that at this time in your life, you have a purpose, and, or you wanna find a deeper purpose to be of service to what is unfolding on this planet, that at your precious time and energy that you might have, if you have the possibility, the privilege, of not having to struggle with just some basic, but the very basics, and want to put that time and energy in that. I think these are important questions. It's how do you get yourself to be more active and engaged within yourself and with others and with what's happening in the world um, to see what you can contribute to this idea of cultivating a world of lasting peace. So let's get to our practice. If you, have, you may have things to reflect on that, let's discuss that after. Um, before we get to our practice, wanting to, to just combine the combination of both cultivating fierce compassion as well as <clears throat> resilience. So uh, finding a way to sit <clears throat> where your body is, um, your spine is straight. So you want to, in, in this practice of, of cultivating presence, awareness, balance, and flow, you also want to just notice where are you contracting, where are you rigid, in, in, in either mentally or emotionally or physically, um, to be looking at that. And certainly in terms of um, physically, we're so programmed and now we're spending so much time on the, on the internet that we tend to contract. And this is like our normal state of being right now and <laughs> for, for a lot of us and to be able to give some space, particularly to our lungs, which at this time is really important to create more lung capacity, to take in uh, oxygen, keep our lungs healthy and strong. Finding a way to sit where your spine is straight, your, your, your belly is relaxed, your, 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 your jaw is relaxed, elongation from the back of your neck as well, relaxing your jaw tucking your chin in a little bit towards your chest. And for those of you who were uh, here for the first time, just to, to, uh, well, to remind you now, bring your attention to your center or your core, which is in your lower belly. And how can you locate that? That's approximately the width of three fingers below your navel and a third of the way into the body. So if you put your fingers together like this, place your index finger over your navel where your pinky 
resides. That's approximately the width of three fingers below your navel. Now bring your attention inside of your body about a third of the way. from the front of the body. So bring your full attention to this spot, the width of three fingers below your navel, a third of the way into the body. I would call this your center or your core, your center of gravity. Creativity, impulse, where your personal power resides and your center of awareness, how you perceive your reality. And imagine this idea of cultivating resilience and imagining for yourself, just breathe into the possibility of the scope of influence you could have on this planet. And that scope of influence could be with yourself. It could be with your family members and those close to you. It could be your neighborhood. It could be your community. It could be your city. It could be your state. It could be your country. It could be the world. And just imagine like going on a road trip, all the reserve of, of energy that you would have to bring with you, making sure your car is filled with gas, you've got enough um, yummy drupya and, and, and snoop and candy and, and, and food and water. Now imagine your center your, your, as, a, as a battery. And in any given day, all the things that you are navigating and, and having to go through for the long haul, for the question of resilience and sustainability, seeing your core as a battery and just checking in and seeing how charged is your battery right now. Just feel into that. It's all intuitive. There's no, it's not a quiz. It's not biological. From zero to a hundred, how full is your battery right now? And just make a note, it's no good or bad. It's just to say, if you wanna make it through this day, you wanna make sure your battery is as charged as it can be. And if you find that it's running out of juice, you wanna charge it up. So before the practice, just to get our nervous systems a little activated, get a little um, energy moving through the body, opening your eyes and shake your body a little bit, shake your hands. So shake your hands. Just shake out your hands, keep the hands shaking. Now shake out your elbows, shake your shoulders, shake your head. If you feel silly doing this, great, you're on the right track. Shake your head, make a sound with your voice if you want. <laughs> shake your chest, shake your torso, shake your pelvis if you can, shake out your feet. Get the energy moving, keep shaking. Activating the sympathetic nervous system to activate some of those good stress hormones that enhance the system and feed your battery in a sense and release, release. Come to stillness and come back to what we call power sit with your, so your spine straight without being rigid, elongating in your spine, elongating from the back of your neck, tucking in your chin, belly relaxed. Now feel the efforts of the shaking you just did Energy moving through the system, clearing out toxins, releasing emotions, reminding you what balance and flow is. And use some deep breaths in through your nose and out through your mouth to activate the parasympathetic nervous system to bring the body back to balance. The foundation of you cultivating resilience, knowing when your system is activating the sympathetic nervous system, activating the stress hormones, which help you en enhance performance, decision-making, clarity, presence, and connection, and knowing when you're not overstressing yourself at that exact moment when you need to activate the parasympathetic nervous system to bring yourself back to balance. before you activate more stress, more stress hormones. Checking in with your battery now, noticing how charged it might be. 
if it's changed. And from your center, become aware of your physical body. All you're doing is listening. This exercise supports you in cultivating deeper listening, awareness. So let your body speak to you. Begin to understand the vocabulary and the wisdom of your own body through sensation, rhythm of breath, heartbeat. Tension, relaxation. From your center, become aware of your emotions. Knowing that all feelings are welcome. Just observing without judgment, simply assessing what emotions are you present to right now. From your center, become aware of your thoughts. Maintaining a connection with your core, now bringing awareness to your heart or the middle of your chest where your heart power resides. Compassion, respect, connection. And from your center and from your heart, become aware of the part of you that connects with something larger than yourself. It might be something spiritual, it might be humanity, it might be your highest values. From your center and from your heart, with awareness of that part of you that connects with something larger than yourself, check in and see how connected or not connected you might feel at this moment. Let your heart feel that. Let your core feel that. And with more of an awareness of yourself in this present moment, physically, emotionally, mentally, maybe spiritually, from your center and from your heart, take a full breath in, in through your nose and out through your mouth. And with more of an awareness of yourself in this present moment, keeping your eyes closed, building on that connection with the present moment, from your center and from your heart, become aware of your surroundings. Opening up your capacity to sense what's happening in your surroundings, placing yourself in those surroundings, behind you, above you. You've been doing this for a while. See if you can really recall, like specify specific sounds and smells. If you can recall, if you're in a familiar space, where exactly is the bookshelf? Where exactly is that lamp? Could I almost even point to it with my eyes closed? And how are your surroundings impacting you at this moment? Cultivating relationship with yourself and your surroundings in this present moment. With more of an awareness of yourself and your surroundings in this present moment, from your center and from your heart, take a full breath in, in through your nose and out through your mouth. Allowing energy to flow and emotions to flow. Presence, awareness, balance, and flow. Now with more of an awareness of yourself and your surroundings in this present moment, from your center and from your heart, becoming aware of all of those currently in this meditation. As if we're sitting in circle, 30 plus of us, 
in various parts of North America, in various parts of Europe, perhaps other places as well. I'm really open to the idea of that, you know, that there's a possibility of true connection from your personal power and your heart with this circle of meditators in this moment. How might you be influencing them and how might they be influencing you? And with more of an awareness of yourself, your surroundings and those in this meditation circle from your center and from your heart, take a full deep breath in, in through your nose and out through your mouth. Now building on this present moment even more and expanding the capacity in your heart to hold more beings from your center and from your heart with a deeper awareness of yourself, your surroundings and those in this meditation circle. Now opening up your awareness to all human beings, beginning with those human beings that you would label loved ones. So at this moment, maintaining a connection with yourself, your surroundings, and those in this meditation circle, now expanding the capacity to an awareness in your heart to connect with those that you would call loved ones. Do you see specific faces? Do you see groups of people? Are they close by? And really considering from your personal power in your heart, the possibility that you might be influencing them at this moment. And that they might be influencing you. And from your center and from your heart, becoming aware of those that you would label stranger. Stretching the muscle of your heart capacity. How many strangers at this moment do you feel like you can connect with? Could be a neighbor, could be someone you saw in the grocery store. someone on the other side of the planet, someone you may have seen on TV. And how might you be influencing them at this moment? And from your center and from your heart, becoming aware of those beings on, human beings on this planet that you would label adversary. Exercising your heart muscle and noticing what happens within you as you become aware of and connect with those you would call adversaries from your heart and your personal power. Allowing energy to flow and emotions to flow. Now with more of an awareness of yourself, your surroundings, those in this meditation circle, and all human beings, regardless of how you label them as loved one, stranger, or adversary, from your center and from your heart, take a full deep breath in, in through your nose, breathing up into your heart, and out through your mouth. And monitoring this moment to notice the, what you have cultivated to this point, how full is your battery, how open is your heart, taking it into your nervous system, 
this capacity to be present in this present moment, relationship at this moment with yourself, your surroundings, those in this meditation circle and all human beings. And maintaining that expansion in your heart and awareness as we now narrow our focus, so taking the human family with us into our hearts, from your center and from your heart, becoming aware of those in this meditation circle. Notice if it's changed now. Your relationship with those in this meditation circle. And taking those in this meditation circle into your heart and from your center and from your heart, becoming aware of your surroundings. And notice if this practice has changed your relationship with your surroundings in this moment. Taking your surroundings into your heart, from your center and from your heart, becoming aware again of yourself. And again, noticing how this practice has maybe shifted your awareness of yourself in your relationship with yourself. As a way to close this practice, let's take one final breath together in through your nose and out through your mouth. Checking in with your battery, noticing as it changed from zero to 100, taking all of this into your battery, all the practice you've just done into your heart. When you're ready, open your eyes, shake your body, look around, Stretch your body. And uh, that was our practice. So now as always, we, let's take a little time and if there's people who want to reflect, um, unmute yourself. If there's something that you want to share from what I discussed, any reflections you have or anything that came up for you in the practice or anything Sorry. else that's coming up for you. Um. I'd like to share. Okay. So um, I grew up in the Middle East and I remember well the day that Sadat came to Jerusalem. Mm. And I remember the suspicion around the whole thing. And then years of hearing but it's not really peace. It's a cold peace was the term used. And I remember thinking with every passing year of non-war, my generation who remembers war will be dying off. And then there'll be a generation who doesn't remember war. And two generations after that, they won't even remember the stories. So it's a very slow process, but that's what, so, so when you said non-war, um, and I think the black and white thinking, the, oh, it's not peace, it's not, you know, we're, we're, we're not loving each other, so it's worthless, is a very dangerous mindset. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I think that you're, I appreciate what you're naming that, because that is true, and that's a perfect example is that, um, you know, you can, again, you can, you know, like you said, Sadat comes and, and you can have talks and there can be, and of course there's going to be a suspicion because there's a lot of history, there's a lot of pain, there's a lot of trauma. And many of you on this, in this, on this call know you have to heal that. And it's in that trauma that the, that the stories, and it, it, they, they are interwoven. The trauma activates the stories, the stories activate the trauma. And I, and I guess that's something, that's why it's important that we need to cultivate within ourselves that we know what peace is and that we know what lasting peace is and what the possibility of that is, and inner peace as well as outer peace. The, the idea of cultural transformation starts with personal transformation. That's the new in a sense. And we have to keep talking about it. We have to keep connecting so that we don't forget. So thank you, Shelley. Appreciate you bringing it in that context.
Yeah. Hey, Joe, good morning, and good morning to everyone. Um, you know, one of the things I try to do is carry one small crumb kernel with me when we finish on Tuesday mornings. And in some ways, um, I think this morning is a good one, the idea of being reminded and being open to remember that there is one good thing in those that we view in a hostile or adversarial way. And likewise, the ones that we embrace and see light and goodness in, being honest and acknowledging that there is also um, some not so good in there. Because I think, as you said, it immediately takes you from being completely entrenched um, and allows some kind of shift. And where I shift this week, you know, it's early, it's only Tuesday morning, um, but I appreciate that. And I think that's actually a good sort of crumb for me to take for this week. So thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Trish. Thank you. I, I want to just add to that. So, so the, the, another piece I want to say to that is that I'm using these terms like good and bad. It, those of you who know me know I never use those terms. I don't use positive, negative, good and bad for this very reason. And that, and that the words that I would use in a situation to help assess uh, what we're talking about is harmful or beneficial. Is something harmful or something beneficial? And that takes out the, the judgments and just as you know, an assessment, is this gonna harm me or is this gonna harm someone else or is this gonna be beneficial for me or benefit to someone else? So I wanna, I wanna, I'm sure someone could argue that there's polarity in those words too, but <laughs> as long as we're in this realm, I think there's, there, there, there is duality. I think thinking there's no duality is, in, in this relative realm is uh, dualistic. <laughs> Joe, I was going to jump in. This is Curtis. Uh, hey, Curtis. Just really, really appreciated uh, the way you opened today and thinking a lot about um, evolution and sort of the competing, you know, individual selection, group selection, larger systemic selection, and how just, you know, the, the ideas of good and bad are human cr creations. And the question is always good for what, bad for what, you know, and bringing some separation from those concepts to, to recognize them as, as human creations and always asking the question in service of what and who, but also thinking about, but not but, and also thinking about John Powell's words. And there was this quote yeah. that I just returned to recently in his work on othering and belonging. There's a need for an alternative vision a beloved community where being connected to the other is seen as a foundation of a healthy self, not its destruction. And where the other is seen uh, not as the infinite other, but rather as a, the other that's already a part of us. Um, so just the flow. Yes, the flow. Thank you. Thank you, Curtis. And thank you for bringing in John Powell. Amazing. If you don't know him, check out his work. It's remarkable. Yeah, John Powell. I think it's a small J and a small P, if I'm not mistaken. And I, I, it's funny, I think you clarified that, Curtis. You said, I think, it was the, 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 the good, what, good for what and bad for what. And I think you clarified it, good for whom and bad for whom. I think that's the bigger question. Who determines, and that's what I said last time, who determines what's good or bad? Usually the, the ones in power, the ones who write the history. If, if I could venture a, um, to try and share a semi-thought, semi-formed thought and we'll see how this goes um, <laughs> just around that what what's what's going through my mind is um uh, i often look to myself to see what i can change in myself in a situation um and uh there are times when we need to influence and bring others along and it's kind of in this place of like um, what is mine to affect and change and and when when is it mine to call someone's attention to what might change in them. And I've, I've actually found myself sometimes, it feels like I've actually corrected too far internally and, and even stepped out of the relational in some ways. Um, uh, so I guess I'm, I'm just, just putting out there that that question of, of 
when is it mine to change within me, which is, which is what I love about this practice is it comes back to like, how am I bringing in all of these circles of people into my perception and myself. Um, but then when also is it time for me to, um, you know, invite others into uh, something new. Um, and that, that can be a difficult place that I can get caught in sometimes. I'm just realizing that in this moment. We'd love to talk more about that sometime then. I'd love to talk with you about that. Yeah. But I would, I would just, if I may, just say one thing. I think that <clears throat> the practice we're doing is that we're, as we cultivate where we loosen our rigidity around loved one, stranger, and adversary, we cultivate more equanimity in our hearts. There's more balance. And, 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 and we, therefore, the heart resonates in a more authentic way. And that is attractive. Not, not attractive, from, but, but from an electromagnetic perspective. And I think so th to reflect to that as I think as we, if, if we can hold that and walk through the world, what we just practice and not just do it for 45 minutes once a week, then we attract um, uh, people to us who are interested in being part of the conversation. I think that's part of it. I can't prove that, but I'd say, let's go with it. It sounds good, right? <laughs> One more share before we close. I'm, uh, I'm so appreciating everyone's words today um, and uh, the ideal of balance and equ equanimity, Joe, that you just said. Uh, that I've been, that's been a huge struggle for me the last couple of weeks. I've had conversations with my mother that did not go well and I was really like searching for, you know, where's the balance and um, the idea that, um, uh, so we said uh, war and not war, that there's peace, but there's also not peace. <laughs> and that's, I'm glad you brought today that you built on what you talked about last time that, um, with the symbols, that there's a little bit of that black dot in the white field and the white dot in the black field. And um, that's helping me. Um, and I want to circle all the way back to what Shelley shared about remembering uh, this time of war, and I've been so fortunate. Um, I've spent the last two years interviewing my mother, who is 90, and she grew up in Nazi Germany. Um, and uh, I just, uh, you know, writing down her stories and um, what she remembers of what my father had told her, who grew up in the very similar uh, situation in Poland and, um, uh, you know, in trying to find this balance, I've really um, I've come to appreciate the, the fears that are in her. And when I am reacting negatively, she's expressing her fears, or she's expressing a fear and I'm reacting she's she has her own behavior around her own fears and i'm i i then put up my own defenses when when i feel threatened that she's putting her you know she's putting her behavior um out there that's just her own fear and what in, tr in the struggling with this balance and finding you know well where's the where's the peace me and where's the not peace, I really, um, you know, what I found in this particular case, uh, humility, and that, you know, my mother comes from, a, you know, a lot of fears, and, um, you know, bringing that to, to you know, this confrontation, uh, I'm just so appreciating, Joe, the, um, uh, the last time uh, last week, and then also this week, how you built on that. The, um, finding that balance has been really important. Sorry to go on, Mom. Thank you. Oh, no, no, that's great. And that's really it. That's isn't that what compassion is. It's, have, it's giving the others the benefit of the doubt. Giving the others the benefit of the doubt. So, so there's, um, there's a lot of uh, things in the chat here if you want to see some good information. Um, uh, Curtis posted some some good stuff on the Haas Institute. 
uh, John A. Powell and others. So make a note of that. And we're a little bit over, so I want to close now. And just so we, we started with the motivation, we did our practice, we get a chance to reflect. Um, and I always just want to say how grateful I am that you come back again and again, and we get to do this with each other. It's really feeling like, it feels like a community. It feels like a community of love and power. Um, and, uh, and the more we bring that together, the more we can be a force and, 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 and be of support in any ways that we can. So let's just hold that. And I always say how remarkable that this uh, 30 plus people of the seven and a half billion on the planet, that, that this 30 plus people showed up this time. And then we say it's a statistical miracle that that happens. If you're, for a, if you're a statistician, whatever that word is, that, um, yeah, the, the, the arbitrariness of us coming together, whatever you believe in, it, 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 it's a small miracle. So just let's honor that, that we have come together in, in, in heart space um, for the purpose of seeing the world open to lasting peace, which we are all, each one of us and as a collective capable of. So let's dedicate those energies to, to those areas, maybe yourself, this energy we've generated together, people who might be needing support. Let's send a little energy, if you don't mind, Ron, to your mom. <clears throat> and uh, to others around us, to people who are out there really doing the work, grocery workers, truck drivers, healthcare providers, and may all beings on this planet have enough fresh water to drink and food to eat, and may all governments govern from a place of wisdom as opposed to fear and greed. Let's take one final breath together. Have a great week. Look forward to seeing you next week. And as I always say, if you know someone who might be interested, uh, bring someone along. And um, if anything comes up and you need to share, please get in touch, respectfulconfrontation.com. And um, until next week. Bye, everyone. Peace out. Thanks. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Bye.